Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to another session of Pen at Prithvi. Today is really special. First of all, it's a book launch, and Sohit is right here next to me. But today I'm the host and he's the guest. Today we're going to launch Sohit's new book, Mumbai Monochrome, published by Havakal. It's a very interesting book of uh, photographs and haiku, a collection of photographs and um, haiku that have been inspired by those pictures. So we're going to talk to Suhit about more about the book. But first of all, I'd like to just uh, make an observation as I was reading the book. I, I found that this book was very special in the sense that it doesn't focus on the glitzy, uh, plush Mumbai that um, you know that 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 is also uh, a part of that is also one very important dimension. But this book kind of focuses on the lost, lonely man, and uh, Mumbai is a sea of people, but every fish is swimming alone. So, Sohit, uh, could you tell us a little more about uh, the process of putting this book together? and whether you were really focusing on that solitude and loneliness as you were gathering your photographs. Uh, I think that's a thank you. Thank you, first of all, Vinita, for uh, so graciously hosting me for this event. Uh, I couldn't have asked for a better venue than uh, Penet Prithvi and a better moderator than you. Oh, uh, you. And uh, so I'm very happy to be here. And uh, and it's it's quite a mixed bag of emotions to see one's work out in the world when one has finally parted with it you know yes. the sort of uh, absolutely uh, jubilation yes. trepidation yeah. <laughs> joy and fear yeah. mingled mm -hmm. but uh, but yeah i mean it's it's interesting that you should point this out this aspect of the photos out because it's exactly what uh, i was focusing on okay. uh, i have seen bombay at its most hectic so I, have, I used to be a city reporter. I used okay. to cover civic issues. I was right. out on the street every day, all the time. Right. So I have seen Bombay's fires. I have seen Bombay's mm -hmm. disasters. Mm -hmm. I have seen Bombay's wall collapses, building collapses, minor epidemics. Yes. You name it all. I've seen it. Flooding, right. waterlogging, all. I've seen it. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to focus. I was just automatically drawn towards the quieter side of Bombay, mm -hmm. which is not exactly... Uh, the glamorous side which is not the glamorous side which is not mm -hmm. focused so which is not highlighted, highlighted very very uh, avidly by people so there is so i just found myself being drawn to these moments these were the moments that stood out to me that mm -hmm. called me to document them okay wonderful so uh, sohit i was actually intrigued also by the foreword to the book where you've uh, uh, where you've spoken at length about the process of taking these pictures and most of these pictures you've mentioned has been have been taken on the phone yeah so i believe you're a trained photographer too yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so could you tell us more about the training and what kind of an experience was it to take pictures on the phone so 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 this is just an ordinary phone it's a it's a mid-range device uh, uh, by no way or form the top of the line okay uh, it's competent it does its job which is uh, to take street photo street photos mainly which yeah. is what i do yeah. and to it's quite responsive yeah. uh, where the training i think comes in is in recognizing uh, three things one is that you recognize the frame you know the the composition okay which is a purely subjective thing right then you try to understand which parts are in focus, which parts are not in focus. Okay. And then you try to figure out, uh, you know, uh, the lighting. The, right. This all happens simultaneously and it all happens in a fraction of a moment. Yeah. A lot of it is not even conscious. Right. But any camera that allows one sufficient latitude right. to adjust a few settings here and there is a good camera for the for street okay. photography. Okay. And... Uh, uh, it is often said by many people, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, the best camera you have is the camera, the best camera in the world for you is the one you have right now in your pocket. Well said, yes. I and it's an old saying that. in the yeah. photography community and mm -hmm. I totally agree with it. Yeah. So uh, sometimes one doesn't want to carry one's camera around one's neck. Yeah. So then the phone will have to use, yes. have to suffice as the photographic device. 
and were you satisfied with the with the kind of uh, technical results that the phone gave you technically were you satisfied uh not always but the moment was captured which is more important exactly right and, yeah yeah and uh, i mean uh, a lot of the time when i was taking photos on the phone i didn't actually have a professional camera right uh, i used to have one but right. i had but but uh, i had donated it uh, i wasn't using it very much because mm -hmm. i had outgrown it mm -hmm. it was too basic mm -hmm. uh, it didn't have the right lens and okay. I, I and then i donated it to a journalistic organization which specializes in rural reportage okay called pari right uh, mm -hmm. so for a long time i was without a professional camera or a right. dedicated camera so right. i was pretty much forced to use a mobile phone to do all my photographic work okay i see yeah and then i bought this one it's okay. less than a year old mm. and i was immediately spoiled and now <laughs> i just use this instead of the phone okay wonderful so um as the title of the book suggests all the photographs in the book are in monochrome they're all in black and white and every photograph is accompanied with a haiku that is um almost ekphrastic in effect because it's inspired by that photograph and i had a lot of lines ra lines running through my mind as i was looking at the picture so it was an ekphrastic experience for me too as i'm sure it will be for all the readers and uh, viewers of this book um so uh, this book focuses almost entirely on street photography i would say and almost on the existential crisis that mumbaikers face mumbai is not an easy city to live in and for the person who's working uh, from 5 in the morning and reaching home at 9 at night uh, it's a tough place and his problems his difficulties are very specific and somehow the pictures in the book manage to capture that kind of crisis that the commoner goes through in mumbai so tell me about your fascination with street photography um that's 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 a great question really um uh, so street photography you know it's a it's a uh, some people call it a very problematic discipline because essentially what you're doing is you are mm -hmm. taking photos of people not always with their permission okay when they are not looking at the camera you are taking photos of them <laughs> or sometimes when they are looking at the camera mm -hmm. but you don't know if they they'll consent you mm -hmm. take photos of them mm -hmm. you're making models out of beggars as they say right correct and mm -hmm. and there is there are rules for there are ethical rules for right. street photography which is that uh it you must not intrude into somebody's uh, personal space or show yeah. somebody in an undignified way right. that that insults the dignity of the human being sure but uh, i think that while these problematic aspects are there i think we also can't throw the baby out with the bath water because what street photography allows me to do is to slow the city down well and to said. look at it well just said. look at it frame by frame mm -hmm. and uh, to point out the humanity in the city as well as its okay. uh, harshness right you have to slow it down you have to because it's going by so fast yes and uh, if in so doing it brings cheer to people then that can't be a virtueless act not at all and i think it also documents reality yeah and it's very important to just stand still for a moment and look at what's happening absolutely instead of being a part of the rat race all the time absolutely and and there are times when you know you show your photographs to people that yeah. you've taken of them yes and they smile and they say yeah. okay this is you know i like this this is yeah. fine right so so it's Absolutely. not so it's not like a what a paparazzo does mm. which is essentially an invasion of privacy for mm. the sake of uh, well for yeah for, for mercenary other, purposes yes, yes. so it's this not is not of like that, that same this is not in that category at all this Certainly is a, not. this is a, probably an art form and it's i entirely it's got, agree with it's you. A, it's got every right to be there yes there is a validity to it i think absolutely i agree with you so i completely agree with you um so we have a segment in this uh, broadcast of this launch uh, of where sohit will be showing you pictures from the book and he will also be talking about how those pictures came about and what is the story behind those pictures but before we go into that segment i'd just like to ask sohit that you know some of the pictures in the book also make a political statement 
like there's this photo of uh, a small child sandals who are been who are bloodied which are bloodied yeah. and they're on the steps of a yeah, building yeah, 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 yeah. probably recording a riot of some sort or some sort of violence i think which one which one there's a picture of sandals yeah yeah yeah. No, child yeah yeah no yeah yeah those blood. are yeah yeah no that's not blood okay that's actually the uh, the the worn out sort of uh, texture of those stairs and oh. the children's sandals they're just oh. children's sandals oh, I see. and they're on these wooden stairs right. uh, this is actually my building oh. <laughs> I see. where i live which is a very old place okay uh, not quite old enough or significant enough to be considered a heritage monument okay. but old enough that it has several stories embedded in it right and right. so these are wooden stairs teak, okay. teak stairs and these okay. wooden children's sandals and, yeah. and the haiku along with it is yeah. uh, that you know that there I is a to. there is a the, that the poet is speculating about their bloodline ending there oh oh i see so that That's is why the I thought it was blood yeah, yeah yeah okay okay so was it was it very deliberate to record things which made a political statement because that's also the camera in itself is a voice yeah you know the pictures that you put out into the world in the form of a book or absolutely. a publication are a voice absolutely so was that important for you to make those political statements I I think so I think so I I don't uh, I mean I didn't uh, set out whenever I set out for yeah. photographic uh, for yeah. a photographic walk right or sometimes I'm just going somewhere and I see something and I document it yeah uh, I I it's happened spontaneously okay you know right. the primacy is to the way the photo works as a photo mm -hmm. and uh, the statement that it makes is part of that process okay. but it is not the central part of any process I think I see Okay. the idea is uh, that the photo could mean x okay but it it is but but the reader should be free to interpret it in different ways okay yes. uh, you know like any art form like any art once form. it's out there it's open to interpretation yeah right yeah, yeah. yeah. but but yes i i would say that uh, yeah. uh, any anybody who's doing street photography is yeah. is doing uh, a political act right because uh, a you are in a public space right uh, b you are documenting that public space correct c you are doing so because you have certain rights as a citizen to be there and to take photos there right so you are in a sense asserting your not only your individual gaze mm. but you are also asserting your citizenship of a particular space right by taking street photos that's extremely well said and i and may i also add to that that it's also your perspective that you're offering yeah so when you look at you know people say that a photograph teaches you to look at something in the way that it should be looked at right so when you take a picture you're actually offering your perspective in addition to all the things that you mentioned right 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 so can we go into the segment of the photographs and Our, our viewers will also enjoy those Thank pictures. You. Thank you. Uh, so this is again a <laughs> yeah, oh. just the first one for now. Yeah. Uh, this is a photo taken from the Sanjay Gandhi National Park. I see. From a plateau there. Okay. You know where the uh, shrub line ends yeah. and the larger landscape begins. Correct. Uh, the white portion yeah. the, the, the 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 dried grasses right. that's actually a precipice okay and then you can see the bombay skyline yes in the distance in the in the distance and this yeah. one kid was there and it was just but somehow you know uh, this is one of my favorite photographs from the book and i found this very evocative of uh, solitude yeah. isolation loneliness because there's a whole vastness to it mm. and there's this small human figure yeah at one end of it you know one at the, at the periphery of one side right right so it's one of my favorite photographs in the yeah. book thank you this is the first photograph from the yes. book it's an in, so there's a framing or an introduction okay. to the to the to rest the, of the to pictures. the rest of the sequence okay and the next slide so this is this is actually the one that was not taken with a cell phone okay uh, if i remember rightly this was uh -huh. taken with my older camera okay and this is in mahim it was a sunday i remember very vividly it was a mm. sunday morning mm. i had nothing to do <laughs> i said camera leke chalte hain before right. the damn thing develops fungus <laughs> you know i should show it some light <laughs> because i did not like that camera anymore 
and then i saw came across this you know this mm. uh, uh, i'm not saying it's a perfect photo but yeah. i wanted to capture the shadows and the light and yeah. everything uh, instead of focusing on these subjects yeah. i wanted to make it more environmental so uh, you know what actually it's even it's better visible in the book than it is on the screen right now <laughs> right because okay. because this all, this picture also really spoke to me okay. because the the light is exactly where the razor blade is grazing the man's cheek yeah 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 and this is the street barber on the footpath mm. giving a shave to somebody right and i think the haiku if you could read the haiku it's right here right 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 razor gleam. razor gleam shadows peeling from his skin oh. fleeing from his skin yeah okay. okay so so it's like the five o'clock shadow on his cheek and the shadows around him are of okay. a piece yeah so i really like the haiku that went with it and um, this picture too thank you the next photo please this is literally in the lane next to my house <laughs> and uh, this was i think uh, one of the rare photos that was taken with this camera okay. the one that i have with me now i see and the story there's no real yeah. story to it yeah. except that in uh, the walker was i think yeah. he had gone somewhere probably to the <laughs> uh, community convenience nearby or uh, for a for a chai or something Whatever. Mm -hmm. and these dogs were tied to that street Cold. sign right and they were just waiting for him and you can see they're mm. they're looking here and there yeah. gaya banda <laughs> when are we going for the walk again <laughs> And this I just, is this is the only photograph in the whole book which I found uh, kind of chilled out yeah. and happy, yeah. and and not telling of in any existential crisis right, in right, that right. sense. Right. Because you know it's very obvious that the dogs are all Labradors and they're pet dogs. Yeah. And they're not street dogs really. Yeah. But the fun part is that they're all being tied to this pole where the dog walker is absconding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Give yeah. me the next slide. So this was actually. Uh, taken with my with a cell phone okay of course i edited it and changed it to black and white oh uh, so uh, this i deliberately have not included captions with this image but this guy mm. was adjusting that drain cover i see so he was a worker that mm. is a some sort of a food oh. many food unit i see uh, and he's mm. poking his hands out and he's yeah. adjusting that cover oh my god and yeah. uh, without context the image becomes something else yes because if you didn't tell me the story the way the picture appeared to me was like as if somebody from bollywood is picking up a suitcase which has been hidden correct and he's trying to run away with it correct correct, <laughs> correct. so 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 that's the ambiguity that i wanted yes it's like is, you said it's open to interpretation yeah, yeah yeah but i really like this picture too thank you thank you this is the photo that you had spoken of oh yes this uh, is incredible and i don't know if the viewers can read what is written on that uh, pipe yeah uh, it's it's, it's, it's who will watch the watchmen yeah so uh, this is the most probably the most overtly political uh, photo in the collection absolutely this was uh, after the anti ca protests had taken place in bombay correct and uh, as you know uh, this place dharavi yeah. uh, this is the, the mahim creek okay so dharavi is not far away yeah Dharavi is very well known for its hip hop culture yes of which graffiti is an integral part oh i see so uh, it has four or five pillars of which graffiti and hip hop yeah. are the are, are an integral part okay so they had actually this is a water pipeline which which okay. is uh, uh, you know which 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 connects uh, mm. which goes from bandra and onwards to mahim and other places okay so yahan pe unhone likha hai who will watch the watchmen yeah well said it's a fabulous line and <laughs> uh, and this kept nagging at me right so i used to go by cab mm. or uber mm. through on the on lj road right through mahim cosbay right and i suddenly noticed this one day yeah and it kept nagging at me and i forgot about it mm. but then i felt like coming back so yeah. so once i actually made my car the, the uber or the yeah. car or whatever a taxi stop there yeah and i came back Okay. and i took the photo and okay. i had my camera with me but it was a wide angle lens okay. so i had to take this on my cell phone oh. using the telephoto oh i see so when uh, i kind of looked at it very closely because at first glimpse i thought this was a good strain that had stopped on its tracks right you know it was a stationary good strain and right. this was kind of written on the bogies 
But then I said, no, this doesn't look like a train. And this is something that's uh, that's very telling. They're asking you who's going to watch the watchman. Yeah. So then I said, this is a terrific line and a very, very political. And it has an intense context to it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, and it's still there. Oh, I so, see. So graffiti, the thing about graffiti is that it is devilishly difficult to deface it. <laughs> Water doesn't do it. Nice. Solvent doesn't do it. Okay. You have to use special chemicals oh. or a pressure hose, right. industrial quality strength. Right. So it's still there. It's peeling, but mm. it's still there. Okay. So mm. uh, I think, is there one more slide or we're done? Okay. Okay. So that was fabulous. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Suhid, I have to tell you something that I'm a bit of a photography buff myself. Nice. <laughs> And there have been times when I have also uh, indulged in a bit of street photography. It's not possible for me to just take to the streets uh, whenever I feel like it. But whenever I can, uh, I try and sort of record whatever I see. So once I was in Matunga, uh, just outside a restaurant, and there was this beggar woman, very old woman. She She was begging. She was sitting on the pavement with the little plastic spread out in front of her. Oh. And somehow I had left my phone in the car and I didn't have any camera with me. Right. But the amazing thing was that this woman was reading a newspaper. Okay. And to imagine that she was educated yeah. enough to read a newspaper. And I wanted to capture that because it was a very telling image, but I couldn't. Mm. So the reason why I'm telling you this short story here is because there are so many photographs that you miss more than the ones that you've taken, what stays back in your mind is the other ones that you've missed sometimes. So have there been such incidents with your photography career? Absolutely. Tell us about uh, it. In fact, you know, uh, like they say, the one that got away. That's exactly what I'm That's asking. That's what happened. So yes. this was not, I actually got the photo. Okay. But I had framed it incorrectly. Oh. So the main focus was diverted mm-hmm. all across the frame and it should have been at the center of the frame. Right. A simple frame, I was at Chopati. This was when I was still learning photography. Okay. This was way back in 2012, probably, or even earlier than that. Okay. And part of my assignment was to go and take photos right. with my first camera. Right. So I saw that there was this uh, little wheel, mm. uh, you know, that oblique Ferris wheel kind right. of a thing, not very huge, yeah. which fits five or six people. Right. So there were four, three or four burkha clad women mm-hmm. going around in it. Oh, I see. And it was a beautiful thing, you know, because the, everything is colorful. Their yeah. costumes are black because yeah. they're burkhas. Monochrome. Yeah. And they're going around on a Ferris wheel. So that lens is kind of different. Very interesting. So I took a wide angle photo of people looking at them while they're on that Ferris wheel. Right. Which, took, which takes away attention away from that photo. And I showed it to a professional photographer later. And he said, Ariyar, if you had taken it just like that, yeah. you know, that would have been a superb picture. Right. And... Uh, I'm glad it didn't work out because okay. then I learned a valuable lesson, which yeah. is you yeah. sort of. That's right. Uh, you remember, you learn, you live and learn, and exactly. this, uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I've missed a lot of photos also. <laughs> uh, sometimes there was a very dry period uh, before, uh, you know, uh, three or four years back. Okay. And I wasn't doing much photography uh, when my camera was just lying, lying idle. there, idle. And uh, so I must have missed innumerable photographs that I that that could have been very good, that could have brought me great satisfaction yes. and fulfillment. So you're right, they do. Mm. But somewhere, you know, uh, one stays humble because there is nothing more humbling than photography. Mm. In writing, you can always go back and uh, edit, edit mm. and you can keep it for a year if you like. You right. can keep it for ten years if you like. Right. And then when you grow as a person, you can revisit it. But with photography, there's nothing like that. Once mm-hmm. you've missed the moment, you missed it and it will never come back again. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it keeps me very humble, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a photographic student. Right. I'm not a, you know, I'm not an accomplished photographer yet, mm-hmm. although I would like to be. Of course. So, so it keeps me grounded, you know. Missing mm-hmm. photos keeps you grounded. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but even the ones that you get, you know, mm-hmm. uh, one tends to look at them with a certain dispassion at this time. Okay. There was a very famous photographer, the father of modern street photography, mm. André Cartier Bresson, okay. who said that the first 10,000 photographs are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine. 
imagine if you said that for poetry. <laughs> imagine, imagine. It would... Your entire life. Oh my fast. God, oh my God. One doesn't even write 10,000. Exactly. <laughs> but, uh, okay. but you know, if you if one is an ex if one is an enterprising photographer yeah. and one goes out with the intent yeah. and one does nothing but take photos, it's yeah. possible to take 200 photos a day. So in a five or six years, you will get to a significant, 10, yeah. Mm -hmm. And those Henri Cartier restaurants are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very humbling sort of thing. It's yeah. a good thing to remember. Yeah. Right. So the one that gets away always teaches you valuable lessons. Yes, yes, right? yes, 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 yes. Okay. So this book is also about poetry because it has haiku, which have been inspired by these images, these wonderful images that you've taken. Thank you. Tell us about the process of writing these haiku. What, did they come by easily or did you have to ponder or were they just completely inspirational and somehow they matched the photographs? Yeah. So, so uh, I actually had a few haiku and more photos than haiku. Okay. But it was my publisher, uh, Havakal, yeah. and uh, and the, uh, one of one of the people who, uh, who are part of the founding uh, team, uh, Kirti Sen Gupta, yeah. who suggested that for every photo there should be haiku. Okay. So I actually, this was the first time that I was writing haiku to measure, mm -hmm. you know, ekphrastic mm -hmm. haiku. Yeah. So I was looking at the photos and yeah. writing haiku for those photos. Wonderful. So I, I did two drafts of them. Right. And so this is the second draft of the haiku. Mm -hmm. So, but yes, I wrote them to measure. Right, of course. Which I've never done before. Yeah. So talking about your publisher, Havakal is your publisher. Yeah. And uh, congratulations, Havakal, for bringing out an unusual book which is a combination of poetry and photographs by the same person. So tell us what it was like to approach them and was it easy to get the book by the publisher or did you have to sort of convince them? I'm, I'm really very grateful to them mm -hmm. because uh, literally the proposal, yeah. I, I did not, ha I, I, the proposal was accepted in five minutes by Bitan oh. Chakrabarti, oh, who is the uh, founder, who is yes. one of the founders of Havakal. And he was like, we will do it, we will do it as a traditional deal okay so they did not take a single rupee from me okay they said we will put our money into this project okay. and in fact they will be giving me royalty for it if it's so, so i mean nobody is doing that mm -hmm. for photo books in this country and suddenly yeah. they are also mm -hmm. i want to point out that this uh, to use this demi format or this this yeah. format yeah. for a photo book is yeah. actually very very unusual anywhere okay Usually photo books are larger. They are 8 inches exactly. by 11 inches or they are square format or yeah. they are fully A4 size or even bigger. Coffee table. Coffee table right. size. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that would have made it unaffordable for anybody to buy. Yeah. So so they decided it was completely yeah. their idea to design it this way. Okay. To price it as it is, to price it cheaply and to right. make it available to as more people than right. uh, possible. So I'm really very grateful right. to them. Right. Uh, for uh, and and they finished designing it in a week. Oh, wonderful! From conception to Excellent. execution took us about a week. Excellent. I'm I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm quite impressed. Yeah. Absolutely. So may I request you to read some of the haiku that are in the book? Yes. Thank you. Um, so I'll I'll read uh, maybe three haiku. Okay. If if that's if that works. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, this is actually my favorite from, this was written many years ago. Right. Crossroads, I wait for the cool wind to go first. Wow. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Lovely. And uh, so, this is a haiku that accompanies the photo you saw of the children's sandals. Mm. Uh, children's sandals headed nowhere, my bloodline. <laughs> So, you That's know, a good one. yeah, so and uh, and just uh, one more, you know. So this is basically this is the Kala Goda Arts Festival yeah. where all these mirrors are Correct. hung in the shape of stars. Yes. Uh, fairground, mm -hmm. empty mirrors await new mirages. Lovely. Lovely. So That's uh, I, <laughs> okay, there are two that I liked very much also. Okay. I will just read them out uh, with a small reference to the photographs that they are linked to. So there's one a picture that Sohit has taken of light reflected on a wall. And mm. somehow it's a slatted light because there must be some sort of a grill. 
Yeah, gorilla perforation, that yeah. kind of, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting because this is also like in the 575 syllable. Yeah. <laughs> So for this for this picture he says evening the sun's light forms a haiku. I like that. Thank you. And there's another very lovely picture of uh, a typical Adda style carom uh, you know session where there are four boys youth playing carom, and the haiku <laughs> to that is carom pieces we huddle near a black hole. I like that too. Thank you. Thank you. So. Coming back to photography, Suhit, mm. um, there's this thin line between what you see and what your camera sees. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And for a good photographer, the camera should see what you are seeing. Right. 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 So photography is really all about perception. Yes. It's about capturing the moment and being quick to capture the moment and and not depending on the on the technical side of what you have with you. Yes. Right? Yes. So could you tell us more about how important it is to perceive things and and see a story in a very ordinary sort of a scene? Mm, yeah. How does that happen in the mind of the photographer? So uh, uh, I wouldn't know about other photographers. I can only talk about my own practice, which is still evolving. I think that somewhere, you know, uh, five or six elements have to come together okay one is the composition i'm very i'm very interested in composition the way that different elements are scattered right. or arranged in the frame right. that if i see a composition it means that i'm very very invested in that photograph okay. that i'm going to take that photograph right so i think composition lighting mm -hmm. and also the emotional or intellectual content of that mm -hmm. photo mm -hmm. if these three things come together for me mm -hmm. then and this happens in a split second. It happens exactly. That's that's the thing. You don't plan photography, street photography yeah. in particular. Yeah, yeah. Right. Although sometimes, you know, sometimes what happens is, mm -hmm. I don't always work like that. Sometimes what happens is that you stalk a photo. So you stand around at a corner because there's an interesting background. Yeah. And you wait for somebody to come by. Right. And you take that photo when they pass, <laughs> or some something happens. Okay. But uh, so sometimes one does that. Sometimes mm -hmm. everything is just there. Okay. And sometimes one has to wait for something to happen, the light to change, yeah. for a cat to turn its head, Absolutely. something like that. Yeah. But uh, but it's patient. It's a patient uh, thing, really. Okay. You know, once I was in Dadar, in the flower market of Dadar, yeah. and there was this little subway kind of a space yeah. where there were these uh, families of uh, three or four families of very poor people. Yeah. They yeah. were sitting on the ground and kind yeah. of taking stock of whatever belongings they had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was one tiny little girl who was wearing a beautiful frock, a mm. nice gauzy dress. Right. And suddenly she she just sort of, she was sitting on the floor and she had spread out her legs and hands like this. So she looked like a flower, you know. Oh, wow. And there was a photographer whom I was observing who, then she got up and she walked away, but mm. then he called her back and he made her strike the same pose again. No. So do you think you know that aspect of it because sometimes photo photographers try to manipulate an image yeah how does how does that uh, sort of wow that's work? that's that's a can of worms honestly so my first rule is that i don't pose people unless uh, and if i pose them then the caption will say so okay but as far but i'm not comfortable doing that so i am never posed anybody mm -hmm. for a photo mm -hmm. Uh, that's one way of manipulating it, where you are yes. posing somebody yes. artificially. Yes. Uh, but then what happens is that if you keep doing that, mm. and if you are found out, then nobody will ever trust you again. <laughs> they will say, "Hi, your photography pose karta hai. Right. Even when you claim to not have done it. Correct. But, You've ruined your reputation. Correct. Anyway. Correct. Mm. But 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 the second way of manipulating is more insidious, okay. which is where you Photoshop elements out of your photo. Okay. So, for instance, if you have taken a photo of some nice geese by a pond right. and suddenly some plastic bag oh. flies into the frame <laughs> and you get irritated <laughs> right. and you go back home yeah. and you fire up Photoshop and you delete that, yeah. uh, you know, you clone that uh, plastic, bag. plastic bag out of the photo. That's mm -hmm. cheating. Right. That is also mm -hmm. cheating. So, right. I just, uh, I can't, I don't do these partly 
you know because partly because of my training which is photo yeah. photo journalism right where you can't play fast and loose with the facts right so that is one thing that i can't abide by yes but uh, i'm not saying that uh, mm. photography should not be posed at all mm -hmm. there is some kind of photography which only works okay. if you pose your people mm -hmm. like photographic portraits mm -hmm. portraiture mm -hmm. Studio portraiture, fashion shoots. No, those are different. Those are different. Street photography Street, has to be spontaneous. It has to be unposed. Yeah. It has At to least be. ethics say that it has to absolutely, be spontaneous. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. And uh, between you and me, yeah. and, <laughs> and of course, of us. everybody <laughs> who's listening, uh, you know, uh, photos come out better when you don't pose them. Really? Yeah. Because yeah. when you pose them, you are limited by your... Exactly. tunnel vision yes. but when you don't pose them you're yeah. opening yourself to the possibility of something new happening very true that you don't anticipate yeah that so that true. i think is uh, mm -hmm. one thing that i would be very keen on not doing yeah. i totally appreciate that um so do you set out from home with the intention that today i've got to take a few good pictures or do you always have a camera on you and of course the phone is with you all always so does does the you know, do the photographs happen um, without any planning or do they, do you actually set out from home with the intention that today I might go to this area and capture something? How, do you, how does it work for you? So nowadays I find myself uh, going out ex with the explicit intention of taking photos. Okay. I call them photo walks. Uh -huh. And uh, I start off, started off uh, with... Uh, I started off just exploring the lanes near my residential area, Mahim and Matunga. But later on, I found myself engaging with the need to document other parts of Bombay. Right. So I would take a cab to other parts and get off there and walk around there. Only with so, the purpose of photography. Explicit purpose. And I would be very, very interested in looking at streets. I would follow a street from Chowk to Chowk. Right often for a couple of kilometers right. on foot mm -hmm. uh, with the explicit intention that, okay, I'm here to take photos and that's what I'll do. Okay. But uh, that was not the case before I got this camera, okay. which is another example of how tools influence the maker. Okay. So this camera is very, very good for street photography because mm -hmm. it it's well made. It's designed for as a very specialist machine. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't use this for sports or for fashion, but you would use it for street because it allows for a split second shooting. Right. So when I got it, I was like, OK, now I've got it. Now I'm going to have fun with it. So I went out for a lot more photo walks. Mm -hmm. But the photos in this book, which are compiled from an output of about three or four years. Mm -hmm. I was just uh, that was a time when I was just going out about my daily business. This was obviously before the lockdown had was there. And I was just going about my daily business mm -hmm. and I would see uh, something and I would take a shot on my phone. Mm. <laughs> so it was completely not unplanned. Okay. Uh, now, if it, what gets more interesting is whether or not, which is better. Okay. And I don't have an answer to that. Mm -hmm. But if you set out for, uh, with the explicit intention of getting a photo, it's less uh, about, it becomes more output oriented uh, because then you feel that, okay, I could be doing some, I could be working in this time. I could be reading in this time. I could be writing poetry in this time. So I have to justify it somehow by producing at least one uh, good photo, <laughs> which is not a right way to look <laughs> at any hobby or any vocation, I think. Mm. One should be process oriented, not, mm. not so much uh, Result-oriented. Result oriented. Mm. But that creeps in somehow. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so there has been, luckily, there have been times when I have just gone out for a photo walk mm -hmm. and absolutely nothing has happened. <laughs> and I've been grateful for it. Okay. Because it has taught me patience. Right. And there was one time in Fort where I went and got one photo very early on in the mm -hmm. photo walk. Mm -hmm. And then for the next half hour or maybe 40 minutes, nothing. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, this is fine, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm going to call it a day now. Yeah. And then when I was going, I saw something interesting. Okay. <laughs> and suddenly two or three shots happened. 
happened and then i just literally after that i just went home <laughs> so it is uh, i often like to call it uh, i often like to describe the street photographer as a hunter gatherer okay not in a pejorative sense more right. like a forager perhaps forager is a better word mm. because uh, you don't know what you're going to get unless you have a general idea mm. so if i go to the kalaguda arts festival i know i'm going to get installations i know i'm going to get crowds i know i'm going to get colors yeah. but exactly what i is not sure yeah. so it's a forager's thing and it is exactly the instinct which makes journalists okay so they are from the instinct is similar to just mm -hmm. become a hunter and forager mm -hmm. i think the unpredictability of it also adds to the pleasure absolutely so somehow absolutely so and there may be some very keen photographers who may be viewing this broadcast so would you like to tell them the exact uh, specifications of this camera got it so so this camera is a uh, is made by fuji film it's an xc3 as you can see it looks like an old film camera it's a mirrorless camera it's very lightweight so you can literally put it around your neck by the strap and walk around all day if you want mm -hmm. not advisable but if you want you can do that uh but what i like about it is that all the controls are out there where you can see them and uh i want to say that you know you should not always shoot in manual mode i know it's the professional thing to do it's what people it's like driving a car always in the manual mode which which people do mm -hmm. but sometimes if you use manual mode a lot you're going to miss the moment mm -hmm. so what's more important getting the photo or proving to yourself that you are an expert photographer so i shoot in aperture priority where i choose the aperture value and the camera decides the, and i choose the iso and and the camera decides the shutter speed that is how a lot of street photographers work there are a lot when you're on the phone obviously you have even less control than that obviously so you can't change every setting at the mm. most you can change one or two okay so you let the camera do its thing okay and you focus on the framing and the artistic part of it right so sometimes when the camera doesn't know what to do then you give it explicit commands mm. through manual setting otherwise there is no shame in letting the camera decide the simpler things in life <laughs> there is no shame at all there is no okay. uh, because you you want a good photo and you want to capture the moment you don't want to fiddle with your settings for every photo yeah and and miss the moment and right? miss the moment that's important yeah and the second thing i would say is that uh, less is more so i have only one camera and one lens so i don't have a telephoto lens i don't even have a 50 mm this is a 35 mm wide angle uh -huh. which suits my purposes which is street photography okay. if you are into if uh, if you are into fashion or if you are into portraiture then you need mm -hmm. different equipment mm -hmm. but as far as i am concerned this i'm set for the next 5 6 years i don't want any further equipment okay this is the only thing i need for street photography so i'm sure that was very beneficial for some of you who are really keen photographers <clears throat> and budding photographers um have you exhausted <clears throat> have you exhausted mumbai uh, so hit oh, oh god oh no absolutely <laughs> i don't think it's uh, even possible you know uh this is i think uh, 434 square kilometers of which 100 square kilometers is the sanjay gandhi national park yeah so leaving that aside okay. that is why life mm. uh, of a different kind <laughs> uh, i don't think i've even begun to exhaust mumbai and also you know i am not exactly do there are two ways i think to approach mumbai mm -hmm. one is the way in which the great photographers do it like raghurai mm -hmm. like uh, you know the his our contemporaries what would be that way is, is that the colonial which is the, the grand yeah the grandeur of mumbai the 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 the, the great statement you know okay. the iconic photograph the yeah. the iconic symbols of mumbai the colonial the flavor of mumbai hmm. the other way to do it is to focus even closer and look at the people of mumbai and the minor yes. moments of mumbai i right. think i don't think you know yeah Uh, because uh, there is a lot of good work about mumbai that has already been done yeah 
one doesn't want to repeat it mm -hmm. because what one will produce is invariably going to be an inferior copy. We are talking about yeah. the greats. I understand. So might as well look at smaller segments of Mumbai, but look at them in deeper detail. Mm -hmm. I think I, I still want to do a lot of street photography. Mm -hmm. I'm very biased towards the old parts of Mumbai, mm -hmm. the island city, so to say, from yeah. Mahim to Kulaba. Okay. Okay. Although with, uh, although I would very bigotedly mm -hmm. claim Bandra is also part of that <laughs> <laughs> because because Bandra is just so damn photogenic. Yeah, I'm sure you have a lot of people standing up and saying no, no, <laughs> no definitely no not. But 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 there you have it. There you have it. But I haven't really begun mm -hmm. to scratch the surface of Mumbai. Okay. I feel because I wasn't ready. Okay. It's only now that my skills are approaching where I can actually try to get some more of the city in the frame because it takes a lot of time for a photographer to develop mm -hmm. 10,000 photos. So <laughs> I haven't even crossed half of that probably. Okay. But uh, what I really wanted to say was that uh, I want to get into portraiture and es photo essays now. Right. Where one is not just capturing a single moment, but one is capturing a sequence of events uh, of people's lives and telling a story through them. That's wonderful. That's really interesting. And because it is, Bombay has so many stories, Mumbai has so many stories, I want to do something of that sort now. Apart from Mumbai, is there any other city that you would like to photograph? Or maybe a mountain place or, but that that's different, right? It, it's not it's the very same different. street. Yeah. It's very different. Yeah, it's not the same street side flavor. Uh, see, I have this love-hate affair with Mumbai. You know, I became a journalist in Mumbai and it left a permanent impression on me. Mm -hmm. uh, I began to love the city because it gave me not only my daily bread, but also it gave me enough adventure for one person, <laughs> which is what our profession gives us. But, but I also fell in love with the city and I feel that this is my love affair with the city asserting itself. But it's not a, it's not a healthy love affair. It's a dysfunctional love affair. It's a okay. dystopian. It's kind a dystopian of. kind of a love mm -hmm. affair. So that's what's manifesting itself. Yeah, it's showing in the photographs. Yeah, yeah. because it is a schizoid city, the city of ours. Mm. It feeds you. Yeah. And it also kicks you around. <laughs> At least that is the case for a lot of people. Maybe not it's you, true. maybe not me, but for no, a lot of true. people that is the case. It is true. Yes. So it's. It's a cruel and kind city. Right. And I want to, I haven't done that kind of work so far where mm -hmm. I can show that duality. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I, through the medium of the photo essay, mm -hmm. I or whoever wants to do it can, can look at this duality mm -hmm. more closely. Okay. Which is not something that has been done except in, I think movies have done it, art forms have done it. True. But how do you show it in a photo? I think that's a challenge. That's what I want to look at. So I wish you all the best in that in capturing that dichotomy. Thank you. We are almost towards the end of our session. If there are any questions, maybe we can address them or we can continue to talk about. You will have to read them, Sumit. I'm not wearing my specs. Sure, I'm sure. Sorry. So Siddhesh, I, I think uh, I know Siddhesh. Uh, hi. Uh, How's how's ba how's uh, how's Bangalore? Hope it's treating you well. Uh, what inspired the poet to explore haiku as a medium in this collection? Okay, that's a good question. So I'm uh, I started off writing haiku. Oh. Uh, I started off I didn't start off writing full length poems. I, oh. I began with haiku and I published quite a few also in okay. various journals which look at haiku. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to return to that art form as a mm -hmm. sort of you know, I want to take stock of where I am now as a haiku writer, mm -hmm. as a haikuist, hygiene. But also I wanted to look at, uh, you know, traditionally haiku have paired very well with images. So Japanese artists, Jap Japan is where the haiku yes. originated. They used to draw something and then the haiku would become an organic part of the picture. Mm -hmm. So I thought, uh, why not have that sort of combination except that instead of a painting they would be photos right. so that is how i thought of this idea uh, and uh, siddesh is also asking uh, mm -hmm. given your experience of the city in the present and the past what are your views on the future of mumbai 
that's a tough thing to say but uh, mm, i think that certain course correction is needed let's not even talk about climate change that is now you know it's the tipping point is not there but a lot of bombay is going to be submerged and by 2050 unless drastic action is taken on a global level mm. so we are talking not just of bombay we are talking of all global cities which are coastal yeah. and which are at sea level but the other thing that i want to say is the civic prob- the, the the development plan for the city seems to be conspicuous by its absence so we are focusing on buildings and more buildings and more buildings and more mm. buildings and more buildings uh, there was uh, which 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 leads to massive problems when uh, the crap hits the fan because as you know the 2005 flooding was caused by partly by the constriction of the mithi river over the decades because of construction mm-hmm. ask any decent scientist what was the bandra kurla complex before it was built over it was a mangrove forest it was a creek yeah. fishing used to take place there Gosh. and if it was still there today or in 2005 maybe the flood would not have been so severe because the creek would have taken the water mm. away to sea so partly we are to blame for the way in which we have allowed bombay to be built up in the way that it has so i think course correction is still needed we we can't let bombay i mean we can't do anything about the buildings that are already here but we need to produce provide more open spaces for bombay in let's say the eastern coastline where the salt where there are salt pan lands you know mm. we we should not let them be developed mm. or at least they should be developed into public amenities open spaces yeah we lost uh, we lost that opportunity with the mill lands oh. because the mill lands a lot of the mill lands uh, which have now become malls and the shopping phoenix, complexes yeah. <clears throat> the phoenix compound and the could have marine. become could have become open spaces they could have become <clears throat> mass and sustainable housing mm-hmm. so i think course correction is definitely needed but but this is not coming from my experience as a photographer it's coming from my experience as a civic reporter you know this is what experts are saying i'm not mm-hmm. saying this mm-hmm. so this is also asking any theme in mind for the next work uh, it's it's going to be a book of poems okay. i'm working on it okay uh, it's a uh, it, it it it's not about bombay it's not about urbanism it's more of a it's more philosophical in nature and it's still on the make it will probably take a few it'll take some time before it's ready but it's going to be a poetry collection probably we look forward very much Thank to your you. poetry collection thank you your poems and your photographs and there's one more uh, okay speak to us would you like to read from any would you like to read a, one of the older poems one of the poems that i have written bef- uh, okay yeah uh, Would you, is yes, that okay? Yes, absolutely, because it's been requested by a viewer. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so, what shall I read? This is completely un. Uh, read that poem that you read at uh, Anjali's meet. Parkour. Ah, that okay. was a nice one. Okay, okay, okay. So this is a poem called Parkour. um it's a visual poem but let's see how it translates into orality parkour bloated with big questions i remember the lanky french parkour teacher learning philosophy in the cool mountains of mcloyd ganj one fragrant evening in the juniper forest he considered a troop of monkeys making a song of their jumps from branch to branch he'd smiled as answers arrived before questions arose and delight glowed in the infinite directions of the centerless world i realize he'll hold on to that moment as long as he breathes or i would i imagine him leaping vaulting over life's big questions as he smiles lovely thank you i hope the person who requested it also enjoyed it i'm sure he did thank you and i would just uh, conclude by saying that there's poetry in suhit's photographs 
and there's thank uh, you there's wonderful imagery in his poetry and there's no dichotomy there <laughs> but i wish you all the luck with thank you. Uh, with kind of recording and sort of archiving the dichotomy that you'd like to do in mumbai as a photographer thank you thank you thank you very much for talking to us about this wonderful book i urge all of you to get a copy it's a slim book thank it's you. got photographs and haiku and you're going to enjoy it do grab a copy thank, thank you, so you all for being here